Hello and welcome to not Quest of Ruin, because that's <laughs> finished now. Oh no. Oh, no. Season one is finished. Um, we are, in, are obviously in the process of making series two, but in the meantime, we thought we'd play a game. And just to mix up the format, we are going from <laughs> pretending to play a, uh, a real play um, t- tabletop RPG to actually playing the tabletop <laughs> RPG. Yay! Yay! What a Madness. Fre- yeah, what crazy, fresh, stuff. <laughs> fresh crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. <laughs> Who are these voices who are talking even though I haven't introduced them yet? <laughs> Where are the voices in your head? <laughs> that explains it. You're that not explains... the voices in my head, the voices in my head are far angrier. <laughs> uh, so we're just, just going to go around the table and just quickly introduce ourselves. I'll start. Um, hello, my name is Gareth Cadogan. I'm the co-writer, um, director of Quest of Ruin and I also voice Lathar and the Game Master. And again, just to switch it up here, I am going to be the Game Master today. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, pronouns. Uh, yes, uh, he, him is my pronouns. And uh, yeah, we'll just go around the table now. Starting off with two voices that you will already know if you've been listening to Quest of Ruin. Starting off with uh, Gina. Hello, I am Gina Morianti, lead editor of Quest of Ruin and the voice of me. <laughs> <laughs> as well as various other characters in the show. My pronouns are she, they. Cool. And over there we have... Uh, hi, I'm Cassie. I do much stuff. I do transcripts. I do voices. Do I, do? I voice some people. I voice Leah, as opposed to Leah, who voices yep. Yela. <laughs> <laughs> Leah voices Yela, you voice Leah. It's yep. perfectly simple. That's confusing. <laughs> yeah. um, and you do, you've I done do, all of yeah, the art. Yeah, transcripts, trigger warnings. I do art. And yeah. I'm you excited do, for yeah. game. Yeah. You do all the little bits behind the scenes. Yeah. That kind of keep things going. Pronouns are complicated. Today it's she, her. Cool. cool. Okay, and we also have with us two friends of the pod, uh, starting off with uh, Quinn. Hi, I'm Quinn. I have been listening to West Runa since it came out. It's an amazing podcast, and I can't wait for series two. My pronouns are she, they. We did not pay her to say that. No, they generally (laughs) did, I swear, I swear. (laughs) Just to be clear. (laughs) And uh, over here, finally, we have my own brother. Yes, hello, I'm Hayden Cadogan. I'm the long-suffering brother of Gareth Cadogan, the um, <laughs> creator and co-writer of, of Quest of Ruin. Um, also, big fan of the podcast, and but he has paid me to say that. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, okay, sweet. So yeah, as, um, as we said at the, at the beginning, we are going to be playing a game today. I'm um, going to be switching, off, f- switching up from the format of Quest of Ruin, which is obviously... Um, sort of more typical fantasy but with a sort of post apoc edge this time we're going for more of a cyberpunk thing so that should be uh, that should be interesting so yeah let's crack on with Escape from the Walled City So we open on a blasted wasteland that you'll have seen in you'll have seen this sort of thing many times before. It's that sort of stereotypical apocalyptic wasteland, circa like Judge Dredd or um, Logan's Run. You know, the, the sort of landscape where it's clear something has gone down. It's not immediately clear what, but there was a thriving civilization here at one point that is now gone. Uh, so black sand swirls around the ruins of ancient towers long since crumbled away until nothing but their skeletons remain. Only one thing remains active in the desolation and that is the rail. Uh, one long straight bar of steel that cuts across the wasteland. Um, it's basically like a, a long train line that delivers what well, is supposed to deliver goods and supplies to the settlements across the wasteland. If we follow that trail, um, follow that rail, um, you'll see the outer wall of a great city. Uh, this wall reaches high, high up, well over 50 feet of sheer black stone and iron. On the other side of this wall is the city, as you see before you here. It has no name, or at least it may have had a name once, but that name has long since been forgotten because everyone living here, it has been generation, generation, generation of people living here, so whatever name it once had has long been forgotten. 
uh, because it's not needed because there is no other city no one is allowed to leave no one is allowed to enter so this city is the only world you know and so if anyone needs to talk about it at all it's just referred to as the city so the city is home to a wide variety of people um, from all sorts of ancestries there are elves dwarves tieflings and many many others um, and along with them also are the helots now uh, the helots are automatons that fill sort of um, servile and like low low class roles within the city so they take care of like uh, waste disposal and uh, you know all the jobs that no one particularly wants to do um, so the city is a place of high towers of stone and obsidian of steel and wires stretching out for miles in every direction uh, from the lower districts where people and helots lit, toil alongside each other at the jobs they do to keep the city functioning all the way to the peak which is this high rise area in the city where the elite and the, um, the super powerful live most importantly to everyone is the temple of Gaianis which is the reigning divine the the god of the city so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my D4, which is shaped like a caltrop. Thank you, Cassie, for this gift. That's You're very welcome. That's really cool. <laughs> and we're going to roll to see who we introduce first. Whoa. Okay. So we are actually going to be begin at the peak, the high rise area of the city, the highest point. Um, the peak, as I say, just if you imagine like most of the city is flat, the peak is basically like a mountain with a little mini village built at the top of it. So it's right at the top of the city. Um, in contrast to most of the rest of the city, the peak is actually quite nice. It's nice and clean. Um, the buildings are made of uh, marble. The streets are like, lovely and... Uh, the streets are really nice. It's lovely and clean. There are little green areas all around. Um, you've got uh, really picturesque features as well. So there's the university with a great big clock tower. There's a library, a theatre, you know, all, all the really nice stuff. Green areas which are kept re in really nice condition by the gardener helots. So as I say, the, the helots are in every area of the city filling out the servile roles. Uh, now the city is a big place obviously so there are churches and chapels dedicated to the city god all over the city but the temple of Gaianus here that's the main one that's um, a huge structure it's roughly like um, two square miles in, in size it's, it's massive um, so this is the center of worship for the city god. Now inside this great building we have the congregation who have g gathered for this evening's prayer so it's getting on towards the end of the day and the orator is at the front behind the lectern giving his um, address to the crowd kind of delivering the, the daily homily and around the edge of the uh, of the temple there are sort of the uh, the senior white helots who kind of like manage the day-to-day -day business in the in the temple as well as the four chosen who are the sort of four head guardians and protectors of the faith uh, one of whom is Alva um, who is stood over at the north wall of the temple. And Gina, could you introduce and describe Alva for us? Yes, so Alva um, is very elven looking. Being chosen, everyone kind of knows who Alva is. She is one of the most well-known people being the, of the four. So very elven looking, uh, distinct, sharp features, pointed ears, very stereotypical. Uh, her skin was once pale peach but over the years it is now almost a pearl white there is a strange sheen across her skin um her hair is a pale blue uh, she kind of wears it in a half up half down but it's in long curls that spill down her back she has many scars across her body there is a very distinct one that goes over her left eye her left eye is cybernetic and her right eye is purple Yes, so Alva is one of the four chosen. The chosen are basically fully augmented. So they are four people who have been chosen from the uh, populace of the city to um, kind of defend the faith, be figureheads of the faith, and kind of be like um, the resident heroes almost of the city. So the, these four are people that the whole city are meant to look to for like inspiration, and these are the, um, the ideals of um, what you are supposed to be. Elva is uh, standing over by uh, one of the walls. The other three chosen are positioned on the other four walls of the temple, um, while at, behind the lectern, uh, Tanisian Quainor, who is a sort of a dark-skinned elf, is the temple orator, and he's delivering um, his daily homily. Um, behind him are these huge stained glass windows, each depicting various scenes of importance to the church. So one is sort of a uh, personification of Guyanist, which is sort of a big, iron-skinned, 
cyclops sort of figure, so he's got one large blue eye glowing out, and he's sort of pictured as hovering protectively over the city, sort of arms spread out wide. A couple of other windows showing um, famous scenes from history, like the saints and uh, pictures to inspire the populace. One of the other ones is depicting the downfall of the world and sort of the salvation of the city. So there's a figure which, to most people in the city now, they just look at it, it doesn't look like anything anyone knows. It looks kind of like an elf, but with like rounded ears, like a dwarf or a halfling, so it's a strange figure. This is uh, depicting a world breaker. These are the sort of demonic figures of the religion who are allegedly responsible for the world's downfall and the reason why everyone has kind of had to take refuge within these cities. Um, Quenor is delivering his homily, talking about you know, how lucky we all are to live in this city, how we need to believe and maintain the faith in Guyanus, how we should look to the Chosen to uh, deliver and protect us, and also talking about how everyone should remain vigilant against the threats that is to come, for it is prophesied that the world breakers will return, and their return will be heralded by the blood on the hand of the fallen angel. This is kind of like the Book of Revelations thing, it's like a well-known prophecy sort of thing, so it's like, this is allegedly going to happen at some point, this is going to be the indication of that the world's ending. Everyone kind of just like nods and goes along with it, and then the homily continues. Um, what is Alva doing while this sermon is going on? So Alva is very devoted to the temple, to the church. Um, she's grown up within it. Um, she entered the church at a very, very young age, earlier than what she was planned to. It's in the title, really. She was chosen. She was chosen from birth, but due to a incident when she was about four, they had to speed up that process. So she entered the church, and that's all she knows. So she is very devoted. She believes 100%. She is listening. She is focused on Quinor. Uh, she does kind of look over the uh, congregation every now and then, but her ears are focused. <laughs> okay, so the homily continues, usual sort of thing. Uh, then the service comes to an end, and um, Tennessee and Quinor thanks everyone for joining them today, and everyone kind of gets up and starts filing out. Um, you see two of the chosen kind of move off with Quinor, just kind of um, going to do their duties. One of the other chosen, um, Judgment, is on the wall opposite you and he's staying completely still um, alongside his sort of uh, halfling assistant who is only known as the voice of, of uh, judgment and he's standing there next to him. Judgment is a helot. He's one of the automatons. He's been augmented to fulfill the role of, of a guardian, of a chosen one, but he's a helot. All, all helots are mute. I probably should have said that earlier. Um, so none of the helots can talk. They are just mute automatons. Um, so Judgment is basically like the um, attack dog of the church, really. So just to give you a description, Judgment is seven feet tall, built wide, like <laughs> if you imagine like the ideal murder robot, <laughs> this guy is that. <laughs> and yeah, as, as I say, he's got um, he's always accompanied by the voice of Judgment, who's like the little this little halfling guy who wears um, a religious robe, and he's there to kind of speak as as if you know Judgment was not an automaton and wasn't just a robot. They, they're kind of stand, staying there against the wall. Um, are you, do you want to talk with anyone as they're filing out, or do you just kind of let everyone go? I will kind of stand near the doors and just be like, thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed today's sermon. It's been a pleasure to see you again. I hope you come back next time. That kind of thing. Yep, yeah, cool. Okay, so um, you see a few familiar faces. You see um, Gorinda Ironfoot, who's um, a little halfling woman who um, is one of those sort of... Uh, those sort of people who spend a lot of time around the church, like their identity is very bound up with their faith. So, you know, they come to the church almost every day. They help out with um, charity work and all that stuff. Um, so she kind of comes up to you and is just like, oh, thank you very much. It's lovely service as always. Um, thank you very much for everything you do for, for us in the city. I'm, I'm so very grateful. Um, no, I'm the one who's grateful. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't I wouldn't have anything to do. Oh, you, you, that, that, that's not so... You're... you're a seriously important member of the of the city. I, I'm... And I wouldn't be important if I weren't protecting the people of the city. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it's a nice off. <laughs> I mean, just to give some context for uh, anyone who is like in the know about religion, um, this is like the equivalent of one of the four archangels like thanking you for coming to church that day and saying goodbye, and then. 
like imagine like the angel Gabriel just being like, oh well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do oh, my job without people like you. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> well, I, yeah, Gorinda Gerind, files off with uh, some of the others. Um, another one who approaches you is uh, Simeon Albrecht, who is um, a low class elf. Um, he kind of comes up to you and he kind of signs um, in city sign language that uh, he's very grateful again for coming to uh, come to the service and he's si- basically similar to what uh, Gorinda said. Yeah. I sign back to him and say thank you so much for coming. Um, it was lovely to see you again. Okay, could you do me a perception check, please? Okay. Twelve. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that's fine. So, um, as you're kind of signing back, you see one of the um, <laughs> you see one of the uh, the senior by helots, which, as I say, are like the the church ser- servants. Um, one of them, which is standing kind of nearby, kind of turns their head in your direction and it just kind of watches what you're doing um, until you kind of clock what the hell it's doing and then its head just kind of snaps back. Okay. I do not let this show on my face at all mm-hmm. because I'm in the middle of speaking with, well, one of the congregation. Mm-hmm. So my focus is more on them. Okay, so uh, Simeon files off and um, do you do anything next or because um, you, you can see the um, another of the church elders is kind of coming over to to you mm-hmm. specifically, so do you wait for them or? What yeah, I'll wait for them. Okay, so the one approaching you is so Tanisian Thaniel is the um, the high Tanisian of the church, so he's kind of in charge of everything. He's like the um, the archbishop, for want of a better word, and so, and you've known him forever. This is the guy who kind of took you in and raised you after you were my father figure. <laughs> yeah, so th- this is the guy who took you in and raised you after you were kind of given to the church as a child. Um, so Thaniel is kind of the stereotypical elven look. So he's tall, long blonde hair, um, but very, uh, very like wise looking. So he's clearly an old guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so wrinkles around his eyes, and yeah, this is a a wise and kind figure who kind of shep- takes his position as like shepherd of the church very seriously, um, fully invested in trying to help people. Mm-hmm. So he kind of comes up to you and says. Elva, are you ready? I, I hope you haven't forgotten that you're assisting with the uh, the blessing delivery today. Oh no, of course not. Um, yeah, I think I've got everything ready. Excellent, excellent. So it will um, we'll just be going in a small party because we don't want to draw too much attention to us. We'll be, we'll be taking uh, two Cenobites as guards, mm-hmm. and uh, obviously yourself. I, I think you'll be enough to handle <laughs> anything that might happen. Um, sure. There have been some stirrings in the streets lately. There have been uh, some rumours of discontentment, but shouldn't be anything to worry about. And uh, obviously, the Houdonis family are expecting their blessing. So, and uh, we'll we'll just be travelling across the peak anyway. So we should yeah. we should be fine. Yeah. Okay. So um, these two Cenobites come out, and they're carrying this sort of not qu- it's not quite a glass jar. It's sort of that sort of look. So it's quite large. It's kind of pulsing and glowing with this uh, bluish light. Um, you know that this is the annual blessing of the church that is donated to the noble families every year. You're taking this over to the Hudonis Manor Estate where they're hosting their sort of annual gala. You all pack up and um, you head off. Yep. Okay, so you're travelling through the peak. Um, as I say, it's, the sun is kind of very much heading down now. You're, you're getting on towards uh, late evening, coming into night. Yeah, so you're walking towards the Hudonis Estate. How alert are you keeping at the moment? A bit more alert than I think... Uh, I would normally be, especially with the mention of there's been some unrest. I know it's probably more in the lower cities, but that could always communicate towards the towards uh, people in the peak, mm-hmm. or there's always a potential that people from outside of the peak have come in. Mm-hmm. So relatively alert, but not too alert. Okay. Um, yeah. So could you roll me another perception check, please? Okay. Nineteen Ooh, plus okay. three. Okay. So. Fantastic. Okay, so I am very. She, she's seeing stuff. <laughs> I'm seeing everything. Yeah, I'm seeing my everything. cybernetic eye is like. Zoom, zoom, zoom. <laughs> okay, so you hear some footsteps, and they are clearly coming your way. Okay, are they coming from kind of behind? They kind of they're coming kind of side from street. sort of all directions. Is it one set of footsteps or it's multiple, multiple steps? It's multiple sets of foot, footsteps. Okay, um, I'll kind of tap Daniel on the shoulder, get kind of motion quietly to. St- slow down mm-hmm. and I'll kind of lean forward and just whisper quietly I'm not going to whisper quietly for the sake of the microphone <laughs> but I'll say <laughs> um, I can hear footsteps are they running? no they're kind of uh, just walking steadily 
Okay, but definitely towards us. Yes. I think um, someone's approaching. Um, okay, so Thanagor kind of just takes stock of the situation and um, kind of signals for the two helots to stay where they are. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, we should, um, may- maybe we should send up a signal, see if we can flag down some uh, some guards or something. At that moment, you hear like a whoosh through the air. Okay. So could you do me a dexterity check? Okay. <laughs> First one of the day. Minus one on my dexterity. <laughs> oh, no. Check or save? Uh, check. Seven. <laughs> I rolled an eight. Okay. <laughs> oh. Right, so, uh, yeah, unfortunately, um, you are unable to react in time. Um, you hear the whistling through the air far too late to save Thaniel. An arrow um, comes out of the dark, strikes Thaniel through the neck, and his uh, wor- his work sentence of, maybe we should flag down the guards, and is cut off and just go, he's just then go, <laughs> drops to his knees, and uh, sort of kind of crumples. I do my best to like catch him. Obviously I wasn't quick enough to stop the arrow, but I assume I'm quick enough to catch him as he falls. Yes. I'm in shock. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> this is my father. <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> um, the first thing I do like before I even catch him is just yell no mm-hmm. and catch him. I kind of crumple to the floor with him in my arms. No, no, you, you can't, you can't leave me. I mean, he, he can't, he, he's got an <laughs> arm. <laughs> no. And I'm okay. looking around. Yeah, so now you can see like a whole crowd of people coming out of the darkness. I'm trying my best to kind of, I'm not rem- trying to remove the arrow. I'm still a little bit in denial. I'm trying to stop the bleeding. Okay, are you going to try and like cast a spell or anything? Do I have, I do have stuff that would... Work, but I don't have all the information because I'm an idiot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Everyone, duck and cover. Okay, so um, while you're kind of wondering what to do, um, another couple of another few arrows come out of the dark, uh, not shot at you. They are specifically targeting the um, the cenobites, the the helots, uh, the ones carrying the blessing. They they, they both hit like the, the helots are taken out immediately. When this happens, the helots drop to the ground. The canister containing the blessing, that's also dropped. It doesn't break or anything because it's like sturdy stuff. It just kind of goes, clang, rolls on the ground. As soon as the helots drop and it's clear that they've been taken out, two metal spikes emerge from the ground, piercing the helots, raising them up into the air, and then the ground beneath opens up, (laughs) spikes withdraw, ground closes up over the top, and they're gone. Hello? (laughs) What the heck? What is going on? (laughs) I'm registering this. Mm-hmm. I've kind of noticed, looked around. Uh, um, yes, yeah. <laughs> I should have specified there. Um, that isn't anything strange to you. Do you know that that's what happens when helots Oh, oh okay. 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 I was going to say. <laughs> and We're breathe, all everyone. like in a state breathe. of shock. Yeah. That was fun to see your faces though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's just That's me. what they do instead of like hearses? Apparently. For helots specifically. For yeah. specifically yeah. Yeah. yeah, not, not random people. Not for people. like <laughs> random people who die. But like, no, yeah, okay, that's, so how, they that's, clean, like, that's how they clean up the streets. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. okay, that makes a bit more sense. Yeah. So I very vaguely register this. I'm yeah. still like, no, no, no. Trying to stop the bleeding. Obviously it's not gonna do anything. Mm-hmm. Okay, what what are you are you still just in shock watching what's going on? I think I'm in shock. I've heard the uh jar kind of fall, but my my mind is on other priorities right now. Yeah. So could you do me I think it would just be another perception, yeah. Okay, you do. So now you are aware of running footsteps. Towards me, away. Towards you. So one set of running footsteps, the others are, they seem to be just holding their ground at the moment. Okay. I'll look up, tears in my eyes, just, you know, looking at the crowd, lost for words, basically. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this guy is uh, just running towards where you're holding uh, the <laughs> Thaniel. Then um, you, you can see that this one approaching, he was in the crowd, but he doesn't have a weapon drawn. He does not. He does not have a weapon. Drawn. Okay. Do I recognise him? You, they're, they're all wearing masks. Oh, everyone in the crowd. Well, the or... people who are around you, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, what kind of masks? Just black masks? Yeah, just black, like scarves and stuff. Just to, they're just face coverings. Okay. So they, they, these aren't like uniformed people. These yeah. are just like people wearing masks. Okay. So do you res- respond to this or? <laughs> so he's running at me, but not aggressively. Yeah, he's just running towards you. Um, I'll call out for help. 
can can someone please help? Is someone a healer? Like, yes, I can heal, but that's not in my brain right now. Mm -hmm. I'm in panic. I couldn't. I don't think I could even focus on the spell at this point. Help! Can can somebody please, please, can anybody heal? Please. Okay, so um, this this guy is just he's completely ignoring you. He's not registering what you're saying at all. He basically just runs up to you, looks at the body of Thaniel, turns around and says, "Yeah, that that did it." And then he runs back, and the crowd and the group around you just kind of start dispersing, like fading into the, no, into the night. No, please. Thaniel's hand, he's still alive, he's still breathing, but he's just like gurgling around yeah. the arrow in his heart. He kind of just grips the, um, the, the the shafts, just kind of trying to hold the, the blood in. He's just, uh, he, he's clearly trying to speak, so he's trying to uh, say something to you. What, what is it? What is it? Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that just sounded like bitch. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's trying to say like betrayal, so that's okay. what he's trying to go like. He's trying to say betray, betray, and then he just kind of goes, and then, and then he just goes run, and then dies. I definitely hesitate because like that's technically a direct order from my father, but I don't want to leave him here. <laughs> Would it be possible for me to pick him up and carry? Um, sure. Do me a uh, do me a strength check. Let's see how that goes. Uh, fifteen. Ooh, just about. Okay, so you can pick him up, but you are. Uh... I turn and head towards the temple. So as you're approaching the temple, you hear some running footsteps. Um, you see some people coming out. Among them is um, the orator Quainor, and he kind of sees what's uh, what's happened, and he's just going, "What? What is this?" What? I don't know. There was an arrow. I don't know who the shooter was. Please help, please. Okay. And uh, while this is going on, you see one of the deacons of the um, of the church, the mm -hmm. kind of um, assistant priest, is kind of looking at you with like actual horror, and he kind of raises a finger and points at you and just goes, "Blood, blood on her hand, blood on the hand of the fallen angel. What? It's her. No, it's her." No! This kind of causes a absolute stirring among the um, the pious members of the crowd. They all, they all start shouting at, at you. You hear shouts of fallen angel, betrayal, that sort of thing. Um, do me one more perception check. Mm -hmm. I've gotten what perception is wasted. There we go. <laughs> Numbers. Uh, 14. Okay. You're kind of surveying the crowd that's kind of very quickly, you can see, turning into a mob. Okay. And you kind of catch, like, in a split second, you catch Quainor looking at you and a kind of smirk on his mouth before he quickly hides it and starts calling, Grab her! Get her quickly! Bring her into the temple! Um, okay, I'm not going to drop my father, but I am <laughs> going to put him down. <laughs> because, like, I can't, I can't, I need to, I do need to run. Yeah. I will put him down um, as gently as I can, as quickly as I can. I'm sorry. And then I will find an opening and run. So, you run off into the darkness with, presumably, a mob of angry religious people <laughs> hot what on your a rough head. morning. Your dad, yeah. gets, your dad, gets, even, your dad, dad gets, gets murdered my, and then you get accused of being fun. a demon. Like, my day was fine. That's pretty harsh. Yeah. <laughs> that's a pretty rubbish day. Okay, so, just to uh, move off that happy scene, we are now going to descend into the very other other side of the city. So we've uh, seen the uh, the high-end member of society, we're now going into the lowest of the low. We are going into the borough called Styx. Uh, the buildings here are rough, little better than slums. Life in this part of the city is mean and harsh, with people just about scraping by. In Styx, no one gets ahead on an honest day's work. Everyone's basically just scraping to survive and doing what they have to do. Um, we're going to focus here on a large central building towards the uh, what is it from yeah the more northern side of the uh, of the borough. Now once upon a time this building it might have served as like an administration center or uh, maybe even a large public library something like that but uh, those days are gone it's it's not like that anymore. Um, now the only sound that can be heard from inside is the sound of cheering and shouting yeah, go on, kill, 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 kill! <laughs> yeah. 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 Along with the sound of uh, screams, the sound of grinding steel against steel, you know, the, but, and you know, general sounds of combat, and along with like shouts of pain and anger, all that good stuff going on. These are the fighting pits of Styx, famous around the city as the place where anyone could come in and have a good night's entertainment of watching 
Basically, gladiators fight robots. Um, yeah, robot wars, but timed up to 100. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, this, this kind of the robots. fighting pits are famous across the city. Um, the upper classes have their, their their grand stadium, wherever they host you know the duels and fencing tournaments and um, lightweights. Scholars of the, <laughs> the scholars of the university can you know do displays of their art and all that stuff. You know all, all the you know high class hold school stuff. This is the as the opera. The opera. Okay, boring stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the fighting pits are as far away from that as you can get. This is just full on, just nasty pit fights, no rules, nothing's off limits. Good old fashioned family entertainment. Good old yes. fashioned family entertainment. Yes. So inside this building, there are multiple um, pits, just like which are basically holes in the ground, <laughs> as the name suggests, um, floored with like black sand. And inside blood. each one, there are like. <laughs> Black sand and blood. <laughs> Black sand and blood. Um, inside each one, there's between three to five combatants all just duking it out with each other with a wide variety of weapons. You've got combat helots, which are helots with their limbs replaced with weapons. So you've got circular saws and blades. And uh, fighting that against them and against each other are actual people as well who are like basically kissed out like gladiators. We're going to focus in on one of these pits where there are five warriors engaged in mortal combat. Three are combat helots, two are organics. The helots are, as I say, whirring machines of death. You've got rotating blades, uh, morning stars at the end of their limbs, just like, just whirling around, just it is. Death machines just doing their thing. One of these helots armed with a morning star. If you don't know what a morning star is, it's a big lump of metal with spikes on it. And this thing just whirls around and kaspoof just smashes into the face of one of the other combatants who was a decently built uh, elf guy. His, his face <laughs> is just completely pulverised. Ex-elf. <laughs> Ex-elf. But as he's hit, he's kind of gotten his, his sword in the right position that he kind of skewers the combat helot that kills him as he goes down. So both of these guys drop together into the sand. As we saw in the previous segments, when the helot drops, Spike comes out from the ground, Chunk pierces the Heller, ground opens up, <laughs> Spike goes down, Heller is gone, ground closes up. So left in the ring are two more of these combat helots and the, the other organic combatants. The crowd whoops and cheers obviously at this brutal display of blood and oil soaking the, uh, <laughs> soaking the sand and they encourage the other fighter who's a favourite of the crowd, a reigning champion, Fingal Dalton, yes. could you please describe Fingal to us? I can indeed. <laughs> so, Fingal Dalton, a mighty halfling barbarian. He stands at a mighty three foot. <laughs> 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 um, he's been fighting in the pits for about pretty much all his life. He, he knows nothing else but the pits. Basically, there's, he, he doesn't really have any sort of knowledge of sort of a childhood and upbringing. He's hey, that's, that's all he's ever known. Is it these pits fighting anything and anyone that comes near him? General sort of consensus is that much like a lot of people, because of the nature of, of the area, he was kidnapped as a child from his parents who he never had any contact with, and was raised to kill, essentially, raised to fight. He over the years to sort of improve him and to, to make him a more vicious fighter has been injected with all sorts of enhancers, muscle enhancers and other various sort of substances to make him much tougher and much harder to beat up, ultimately leading to him suffering catastrophic brain damage. Um, <laughs> oh no! And in doing so, to, to basically keep him together and keep him functioning as a, as a person, he was fitted with an, an implant into his head to basically just keep his brain focused and under control, to keep him ready to fight as opposed to going completely haywire off, off the chain. So his, his temper is mostly under his control, he, he knows how to do it, but without that implant, it could get nasty. He's, he's been a champion in the, in the pits for about 10 years. He, he's, he's beaten anyone who's, who's come near him. And the thing that he, he does, which often people sort of talk about, is the fact that he marks every victory on his arm. So he has a Very tally, he has a, yes, he has a, he has a tally all down his arm of all, all, from all of his fights. 
yeah, he's not particularly. He hasn't got much interest other than smashing, smashing and killing. That's pretty much all he does. Fight, kill, fight, kill, fight, kill. Yeah. <laughs> Up until that kind of bit, we had very similar backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> like taken from Take family. Taken from family. We are like improved, enhanced. Yeah. And, yeah. and then it was like, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, he so and someone found, someone found God. I <laughs> found the pit. I found an axe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Hayden, could you please roll initiative? I can oh. indeed. Oh, Woo! joy. Oh, oh. Whoop, whoop, whoop. This is this is not going to go well. Mm-hmm. No way. Okay, so um gonna start well, off. An, yeah, now one for three. <laughs> that oh, makes no difference. No. You've just seen uh, you, you, presumably a guy that you knew re- reasonably well, um, just completely destroyed uh, by his uh, helmet, um, who gets immediately dropped. And these other two helots were kind of circling around, each one kind of going for you and the other organic at the same time, because um, these helots are kind of conditioned to prioritise organic targets rather than yep. fighting each other. Because while robot fighting robot is fun, it's more fun to watch robots and gladiators do things out. Yeah. So they've kind of been keeping pace with uh, both you and this other guy. Mm-hmm. When he drops, both of them kind of turn their attention on you mm-hmm. and then just immediately just start booking it towards you because yep. th- there's no speed reduction on these things. These are kill machines. Yep. Okay, so this first one is going to uh, take a swing at you. Yep. Um, oh, that's that, that's probably not going to hit because that does a seven hit. Oh, <laughs> no, it does not. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this first one comes swinging at you with a blade arm. You presumably just like block it with your, with the shaft of your axe, just immediately yeah. ding. Uh, other one's gonna swing 10. No, it doesn't. Okay, so just immediately just I'm demonstrate. Tough, I'm a tough boy. Just immediately <laughs> demonstrating how much of a badass you are. <laughs> just blade, morning star, ting, ting. Okay, yeah. your turn. My turn, right. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, well, um, I think I'm gonna rage. <laughs> my, uh, my, he's okay. Um, just to uh, preface that, because I yeah. was gonna do this a little later in yes. the fight, but you're you're jump. I mean, I mean, I've been attacked by two guys, no, no, and, and my mate's just been splattered. I think. I think <laughs> no, definitely. You're justified. I'm justified. <laughs> you're justified. <laughs> okay, so um, on the edge of the pit, you see your sort of trainer, mentor figure, mm-hmm. Ralph Leatherhand, who is uh, another halfling like you. You've known Ralph for ages. Um, he's the one who's kind of been like looking out for you. He's, he's not a fighter himself, but he's like a fight promoter. So yep. he like looks out for talent, and when he sees the right sources, okay, this is the guy. This is the guy who's gonna. So you see um, Ralph leather hand on the on the rim, basically as this other guy gets dropped, mm. he's just going, "Do it now, kid! Do it now! Use the implant! Do it now!" So I I. Smack, smack the side <laughs> of my head. There's a button. Audible <laughs> smack on but, my head. But, so we just go, day, day, no! day. Yes, so that. I'm going to take a swing okay. at the Let's go. <laughs> Does a uh, 18 hit. Oh, that, that yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yep. hits. Okay, we're just so the crowd. We're the crowd. So, uh, I love you. <laughs> Why do we make oh, this motion? <laughs> So yes, so we swing <laughs> with the great <laughs> axe, <laughs> and he does fourteen damage. Okay. So oh damn! <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> okay, so Fingles a strong boy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, how this has gone? Just to give you a word picture, is these two combat helots have just come pelting at you, blades and morning stars and like limbs of death whirling at you. You've immediately blocked both attacks with the half to grass, just ka-chung, ka-chung, <laughs> and then swung the axe over your head and <laughs> brought the head down yeah. into the head oh, of one of these guys. This helot drops down. I'm going to give you this um, automatic reaction. I'm not going to make you roll for this because okay. it's something that you'll know to expect. So it's just mm. like um, a reflex at this point. Yep. So the second you see you've just caramelised this. Uh, <laughs> The second you see that, you like on reflex like jump back so that uh, okay. when the spike comes up to pick up the hella, yeah, it's not like taking you, you out don't as well. Get spiked. Yeah. yeah. So the, that, that hella is gone. Smash. <laughs> is that what Fingal says? Yes. <laughs> Smash. <laughs> Glorious. Can't Everyone in the up. crowd going. <laughs> um, okay, so you've taken out one hella. Yep. I'm going to say you're still within five feet. So mm-hmm. this other hella kind of jumps towards you and he's now going well say he um it is just going to implement all the weapons so um he's got he's got multi-attack 
So he's going to attack you twice. First one is... Oh, that's probably going to hit, because that's a 20, not that. Oh, yes, that does indeed hit. Okay, so he's going to hit you once for... Oh, bear, bear in mind, I am raging. Okay. So I am... I am resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. Okay, cool. So um, okay. you are resistant to this one, so uh, that means... Half, half, half damage, damage. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, so you will take two points of damage there. Two damage. <laughs> Lovely. I eat it up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and you just laugh. Yeah. <laughs> and the next one does a 14 hit. 14, no it doesn't. Okay, so yeah, so you've jumped, jumped out of the way of the spike taking out the first helot that you killed, and this other one runs at you, kind of lunges forward with the blade arm, and you kind of move with the blow so um, you don't dodge out of the way but you kind of yeah. know enough that you can kind of just like twist your body yeah. so it, cu- it comes back to you it does catch you but it's just like a little glancing cut it no it's not that because it's a mace because it's blundering damage as I said you twist it's, out of the way but it kind a, of like take a s- yeah you just ca- take like a little it, yeah. it's basically like a punch yeah so it, it bounces yeah it's just like a poof so enough to kind of give you a oof, but not enough to really do any kind of damage your next attack yes I take a, I take another swing okay does oh, does a twenty three hit? You know what? I think it just might. <laughs> Is that an natural twenty? No. No, no. Sadly not. I so saw the roll and just went. Gonna do <laughs> slashy slashy. Oh, fifteen. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, no. Very strong. You are rolling very well today. <laughs> That's gonna run out. Yeah. We are. That's gonna say this is the opening. Is the this is, remember, this is the You're opening peaking. scene. Yeah, this is when I'm in my. Yeah. Don't worry, we're going yeah. to um, hamstring him in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nerfing incoming. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this hello kind of lunges at you. As I say, he gets you like a glancing blow to the side. Um, you kind of roll with that impact. Through, with your years of experience and training, you kind of roll with that, using the momentum of your twist to bring your axe around and just decapitate this Hella yeah. right there. Th- this head just goes flying off into the crowd. Um, if- oh my god, I caught it! <laughs> 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 There's a souvenir for a lucky, for a lucky attack, yeah. and then the uh, the spike comes up. The helot's body is gone, and all that's left in the ring is you and the corpse of the uh, of the other fighter. Yeah. And the, the crowd around go absolutely wild. Go, 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 Yes. <laughs> Just a tiny little man. <laughs> and you kind of see. I'm an old boot. <laughs> I'm small but I'm tough. And you see um, Ralph on the edge of the of the pit, looking like approving. Just kind of going, yeah, yeah nice. Yeah. And yeah, beside cool. him is kind of a is a figure that you don't recognise. Like you you know the sort of faces that are regulars at the pit. You might not know them all by name or even necessarily you recognise each individual one but you see a face you know oh that they've been here before I've, I've seen them around yeah. this is someone you've never seen before mm-hmm. and they are clearly much better dressed than the average m- uh, member of the public who attends these fights from what you can see it's um, it's an elf looks quite well to do as I say he's dressed nicely you can't see or hear obviously over the calling of the crowd but this elf kind of leans down to Ralph nods taps him on the shoulder and then turns and leaves Okay. a door kind of slides up um, from the pit, and this is the the way back inside the uh, the preparation room. So this is where all the fighters kind of sit around and like make sure their weapons and their armor is all good. You can head back in there, and around you are the other fighters who obviously fight in the pit. Um, among them, the group that you kind of associate yourself mm. with. You don't know if you call them friends, but yeah. they're like the closest thing you have. Yeah. So Fingal will sort of walk through the room, sort of slightly chuckling to himself after a sort of a, another satisfying victory um, he goes to I, I presume sort of his space within this in this room and so sort of hangs up his axe mm-hmm. and uh, just so as, as you go sorry. past the, the group that I mentioned earlier um, you see one of them a, uh, a tiefling who's uh, called Cunning he's probably the closest thing as I say you've got to an actual friend mm. like this this group are the ones that you're closest with Cunning is f- you're friendly with this yes. guy he kind of looks over and just goes nice fight yeah what are you thinking of that not too shabby. Absolutely legendary, as always. <laughs> then there's there's two orcs st- standing nearby. Uh, one of them is Ogret Grim. You know Grim is kind of uh, a lot... He's quite taciturn. He doesn't really say much. Um, he kind of just looks over and goes... <laughs> 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 and 
<laughs> just kind of grunts in approval. <laughs> Articular as always. <laughs> and uh, the other one next to him is Ty Barag, nicknamed the Earth Shaker, because this guy is big for an orc. Mm. Like, he's, he's huge. And uh, he is as opposite of, uh, of Ogric as it's possible to be. This guy is loud, he's brash, and so he just goes, Yeah, that's a, that was absolutely legendary! That was goddamn awesome! <laughs> Yes, Bengal. Yes. Oh, I love the smell of oil in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I go to my my things and I take out like a pick for me to make the mark on my arm for this mm-hmm. for this particular fight. Um, another fighter kind of walks past, and uh, this is Nightshade. She's um, another pit fighter. She's not really friendly, but she kind of just hangs out with your group because she thinks everyone else is an idiot. So Nightshade is dark grey skin, um, black hair, black eyes, so th- this is uh, an elf who, similar to you, she was raised in the pit, she was raised for combat. Um, she specialises more in the sort of strike from the shadows, agility sort of fighting. Nightshade walks past, she's got a couple of light axes on, on her shoulders, she sees you marking your skin and just goes, oh you're not still doing that crap are you? I've got, what? I've already done all of these, I can't just leave one off, can I? <sighs> she just walks off going, men. <laughs> 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 we stand nightshade. <laughs> Hell yeah, we stand nightshade. While you're doing this, uh, the door to these the barracks, which is what you guys kind of call this place, um, that opens and Ralph comes in, kind of looks around, spots you, and makes a beeline for you. He goes, "Nice work, Fingal. Absolutely legendary as always. Oh, I hope you break in the dough today, mate. That was pretty tough. Did you see his head? It went everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've uh, well." His, Pierce owner might have lost a bit of an investment on him, but hey, you all know what you guys get signed up for, right? Or uh, involuntary signs up for. Anyway. <laughs> hey, who was pointy ears? Oh, um, well that, believe it or not, he kind of comes and sits down next to you. That was a, uh, a sign of the Houdonis family. Bloody hell. I, did, I thought they had far too much money to be in a dump like this. Well, you say that, but the noble families, as you know, they don't really take much interest in the actual fights themselves but what they do have is a vested interest a lot of them invest actually invest in the pits because they know a lot of people spend their oh, money you're, here. you're losing me mate what, what how do you spell invest <laughs> oh, <honey>. okay <laughs> just to put this into terms you understand this guy is willing to sponsor you all right which means you get better food better equipment Sound of that. Because he knows that if you're fighting, people are going to come see you, they're going to spend money. Mm. And if he's investing in you, that means that he gets a cut of that. Do I get a cut of that? You, you get the same cut as you always get. You're a, you're a pit fighter, don't get above yourself. No. <sighs> One of these days, we're going to forget, and I'm going to get some loads of money. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, this is big. This is a big thing. I mean, the. Well, yeah. saying, these richos start taking an interest. It means we must be doing something right, well, mate. Exactly. And as I say, this means big, uh, b- big benefits for you as well. Um, the, the pay won't be that much higher, but more food, which is... I, like, I do like food. Exactly. Uh, better equipment as well. You can upgrade that axe of yours, get oh. something uh, get something a bit Oh, nicer. Bessie here. Oh, she's my girl. <laughs> she's always been my girl. But she no, does need a shine, though. She does need a shine. But look, this is a big deal. What I'd like to do is I'd like to take you out for a drink. We'll go to the uh, we'll go to the Iron Hands, get you a couple of drinks in. Ralph, that's the first sensible thing you've said all day. <laughs> <laughs> do you, is there anyone else you want to bring? You want to bring some mates or? Bessie. Yeah, bring everybody. <laughs> bring, bring the whole gang. Bessie. Okay, whoa, 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 slow your roll. I meant like maybe one or two. Okay, I'm not buying drinks for every fighter in this dump. Well, all right, Correct. all right, all right, all right. Get get cunning, absolutely legend. He's mm-hmm. they're coming and. Get all Grick as well. See if see if they fancy her. <laughs> they fancy a joke. <laughs> oh my god. So Ogric Grim, the guy who doesn't really talk much. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you did say earlier. Fingal's not the smartest. He's stupid. <laughs> His Protect. brain is gone. Protect the baby. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, R- Ralph at this point kind of just looks at you, just like, and <laughs> he's about to say something to the effect of, "He's not going to be much good for," some, but then he remembers. No, he, he could have chosen the Earthbreaker who drinks about the same amount as every other fighter combined, so I'm just gonna And probably doesn't fit in the pub. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take that one <laughs> and uh, you'll head off, heading towards the Iron Hand. So you're walking through um, through the streets. Um, as I said earlier, this is kind of a rough neck of the woods. Buildings kind of they're, they're almost collapsing on you at this point because they're just kind of overhanging. Um, these buildings are basically kept up by the principle of 
everything's kind of leaning into each other, so everything's being held up by the fact that everything else is falling over. Yeah. You're walking along. Are you um, are you chatting with uh, with your friends, or what do you want to do? Yeah, I've got my I've got my arm around around Cunning, and I'm I'm regaling him with the story of the fight, getting into all the bits and pieces and details, telling him how how gruesome I thought the um, the elf getting smashed to bits was, <laughs> and generally being a, a loud. Nuisance, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, could you roll me a perception check, please? I can indeed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be bad. <laughs> hey. Oh! oh! <laughs> what was it? Nat, Nat 20! God yes! damn it! Oh That's my yours! God. Your modifier. My, modifier, my modifier is minus three. Oh, um, 17. So 17. Yeah. Even so, it's a nat 20, so mm-hmm. that, that gives some you never, My but, dice are never this nice to me. I love that so much, though. Like, this is going to be bad. Oh, nat 20. <laughs> Who are you and what have you done with my dice? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, you're walking along and you kind of reach a um, sort of a junction where the two streets meet. And Ralph kind of looks around and he looks kind of like he's like forgotten the way almost. He's like, hang on a minute, I think I've taken the wrong turn somewhere. With your <laughs> weirdly high perception, high perception, you kind of clock a noise from the roof above you. Okay. What do you want to do? I probably think it's just some cat or a creature of some some description. So I sort of I sort of look up. I'm sort of slightly confused. So I, I <laughs> sort of yeah, look around, sort of slightly like. Oof. Did anybody else hear that? Cunning is um, he's been entirely focused on your story and he's been congratulating you on the uh, potential patron as well so he he hasn't heard anything Ogric Grimm hasn't heard at all either <laughs> hasn't, heard, hasn't heard anything either <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> and uh, Ralph Ralph hasn't heard it so none of none so of all three of them just kind of looked at you and just no what yeah with that I think I'm I've obviously imagined a noise and carry what happens then is okay so roll me a d20 Okay. Yes. <laughs> Seven. Okay, so you're using your. <laughs> <laughs> does it matter? Probably doesn't matter. So it's your constitution. Oh, constitution. So that will be ten. Yeah, not even ten. <laughs> <laughs> no one is. You are basically immobilized. Suddenly, yeah. um, something has come come over you. It's like a field of some sort of power, yeah. and you are frozen. Right. And you can't talk. So. No one, at, none of the others at first realise what's going on. Then, from out of the darkness comes basically a crowd of, similar to uh, the group that attacked Gina, right. is, you, you can't even count because your, your head can't turn, so you can't even take stock of uh, how many of these guys there are. But this is basically a gang of street toughs who uh, they look very much like they come to mug you. Right. Ralph immediately gives no amount of crap about this. <laughs> just, <laughs> Father! <laughs> Father help! <laughs> <laughs> no, Ralph, Ralph just goes, okay, well these assholes clearly don't know who they're messing with. Boys, take them out. And uh, Cunning and Grim just charge off into these guys, <laughs> weapon swinging, just be like, oh, <laughs> dickhead! <laughs> I'm bad feeling my friends are going to die. <laughs> I'll give you that impression. <laughs> now, while this is going on, Ralph hasn't joined them, obviously, because he's not a fighter. He's just going, okay, cool. Well, I'm letting like my nice. kids play. Let them deal with that. <laughs> and uh, he kind of turns to you and he says, I'm really sorry about this. And um, a couple more guys come out from behind you and you can feel the, the magical field around you kind of part at the back of your head. You can't see it because, as I say, your head can't turn, but you feel something pierce the back of your head. It's basically a needle. Yeah. Uh, so you feel this needle go into the back of your head, yep. um, and it, you can feel it kind of tink against the metal stuff in your head, yep. which you know is where the um, the, yep. the stuff that stabilises your implant <laughs> is. ADHD <nuts. laughs> Ralph says, look, I've talked with them, they're not going to take everything, but unfortunately they need it for something they've got going on. Yeah, so I'm, I'm to, yeah, as obviously paralysed, I just sort uh, <laughs> okay. Then you feel the needle come out, the field kind of closes over, you hear a voice behind you, sort of a very wealthy sounding voice saying, all right, well, that's done. Now, onto the delivery, which I think will be your job. 
and Ralph just kind of does, does a double take and says, hang on, no, no, I've done my job. This was my job. I'm not running any more crap for you. And the, the voice behind just says, do you really think that this one is going to just go along with what you've just done? I think it's in your best interest to get out of this city. And Ralph kind of just like glances at you and you, you see in his eyes, just like, oh yeah, I didn't... Um, probably should have thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm very much got the I'm going to snap you in half eyes <laughs> at him right now. So you kind of see out the corner of your eye Ralph being handed this like little canister of this stuff. Obviously you're not like high in intelligence, yeah. but you know enough to realise that you're still cognizant, you're still thinking clearly, so they haven't taken all the stabilising needed, your implant is still working, yeah. but you can see they've taken a lot of the stuff that is needed to make it work. Yeah. And Ralph takes this and he kind of scuffles off, just kind of moving quickly. You hear slower, more dignified footsteps walking off and th- these footsteps fade from uh, from your hearing and then after a couple minutes, the field goes down and you are, you're free again. So I, I sort of just look around, just, like, just really a bit freaked out because obviously I'm not very much used to being held and I'm usually the one doing the grappling and smashing and... <laughs> well, not Stop used to being saying cold. I'm sad. That's sad. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I then just start just frantically sort of looking around, trying to see if there's any, you know, anyone still there, anybody, what's going on, and then I sort of storm away, trying to look for my friends who obviously then charged off. Yeah, it's crap. So yeah, you, you kind of catch up with them, and yeah, they, they, you're talking about Cunning, who is just lightning quick with uh, with his sword he can take out three guys immediately and Ogret Grim is like he's big silent and nasty so you, you kind of arrive in time to see this or just kind of pick someone up like he's left his sword embedded in someone and he yeah he picks him up like a foot like an American football and just goes <laughs> head first into the ground this guy's just bound this guy's just made into paste on the ground Looney Tunes pancake yeah pretty much. and like Cunning kind of turns around and Hey, Finger, what kept you? We've had to do all this stuff ourselves. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I've no idea. I was just stuck there or something. I, somebody, somebody messed with me. Uh, and I start getting this sort of a pain in my head, sort of starting to feel the effects of yeah. it. So, so I start Grim kind of there. walks up to kind of stand next to Cunning. Is just like, where's Ralph? <laughs> that, him. that, that stroke ran off. Him and that pointy-eared Bert he just walked off with with my stuff <laughs> so <laughs> eloquent I love it Grim's kind of narrowed his eyes that he's not really clocking what's going on because yeah. like as simplistic as your mind is Grim is next level <laughs> <laughs> he is like down three steps yeah <laughs> Grim's intelligence is zero <laughs> he's just like I know eat I know drink I know fight I know sleep yeah. and I know first names of like five people that, that's Grim's whole world <laughs> so you saying this stuff is just like yeah. your, your, your brain does what <laughs> and C- Cunning's kind of looking at you with like more comprehension because he knows more about what stuff you've got going on and he's like wait hang on back up so Ralph stole your your implant stuff yeah just then when all those blokes turned up and you you ran off I was just stuck there and then they jabbed a thing in my head and I saw it they had the stuff that's usually in there you know that, that keeps me from you know going yeah yeah <laughs> and, uh, and this bloke he said something about a delivery or something and then and then rough rough I'm gonna rough. <sighs> all right keep, keep it together keep yeah it together. sorry I, Ralph he, he walked off with it He's, he said something about getting out Getting out of where? Out, out of sticks? No, out of, out of everything. Out of this whole, whole city. He's talking, hang on, you, you, you can't get out of the city. Well, I know that, doofus. I'm, I'm just <laughs> telling you what he said. All oh, right, hang on, hang on. So, R- Ralph's taking your stuff. I mean, he can't have gotten that far, right? We've, he's, he's sorry. Come, no, 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 sorry, it's just, just three really <laughs> stupid people <laughs> trying to deal with all this complicated stuff. Can't have just, just, <laughs> right, hang on, hang on. Look, okay, we need someone who can make a lot more sense out of this than, than we can. Um, Grim, you, you head back to the pits. Me and you, Finger, Will, Will, there's a guy I know, he might be able to help with this, because I, I don't know where Ralph, I doubt he's gotten that far. 
But I mean, this is a big city. You could have gone anywhere. So yeah. it, I don't think if we like run around, I don't think we're going to find him that way. So if we go, we'll go find. There's this guy Echo. Okay, we'll go talk with him. He'll be able to sort us out. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So then you and Cunning head off north towards Acheron, which is where uh, Echo is, and we'll pick up with you in a little bit. So we're going to roll the dice again. Oh, I too. Um, yeah, so we're going to be heading over to Letha, which is the borough north of the River Anis. It's not as nice as the peak, but this is basically as good as it can get for the lower city. So, <laughs> if you were to describe Letha, it'd basically be, it's fine. Like, it's, 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 it's fine. decent. It'll do. It's there. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> heading through the streets and back alleys um, to the very, very edge of the city. Um, so going up here, right to, against the um, the outer wall, going through the, the concrete gardens, which is where statues of long dead and forgotten heroes of the city are immortalised in concrete, as they normally remember who these people are anymore, but they're just there. It's just a nice, this is like a nice area of, uh, of leather. Then through the factories and ironworks, over to a large facility kept well away from prying eyes behind a tall chain link fence. And there, just ducking through a hole that they've been able to cut through the chain link fence, is Zarina. Cassie, would you please describe Zarina? Yeah. So Zarina is an Aladrin. She is tall side of average for an elf, so pushing 5'8". She is uh, like light brown skin, long, uh, like dark brown curly hair that's kind of pulled up into a ponytail, but it's like the best she could manage, honestly, with like streaks of white running through it. She's got like green and black kind of smoky makeup, but it's like it's, like, it's been a couple days and she's just vibing with it still. She is in a lot of like leather, fishnets, that sort of thing. Stuff that's easy to move around in, but also like looks decent. <laughs> Stereotypical rogue garment. Yeah, she's not even a rogue. <laughs> <laughs> it's cyberpunk, we're vibing with it. There are a couple of things, speaking of cyberpunk, there are a couple like screens on her and things to to be light here and there. No physical function, just a side, like aesthetic. One of her arms, she has kind of a like archery glove, but it's all fingerless. And then the other is more of a fingerless glove that kind of goes up her left forearm. Mm -hmm. And she is, she's just there. Okay, cool. So, um, Zarina, you have been sent to this facility to retrieve some confidential information because what you and your informant know, but no one else in the sort of surrounding area know, is this is meant to be set up as like a power plant. This, that's what everyone thinks this is. This is what supplies power to this region of leather. And what you know is that it's just a front. So like all the generators and stuff, that is all for show. None of that actually does anything. That is all there just to hide the actual function of this place which is, this is kind of like the administration office for the uh, food distribution hubs. So here is where you can find the information of where the food comes from, how it's distributed, all that stuff. So you've been sent to this place to kind of retrieve that information. So as I say, you've broken in through this chain link fence, you're now in the sort of courtyard of the inner, I guess, complex. Okay. Um, you can see the uh, the main building, which you can tell is where the uh, the main frame is that you'll need to get into. All you need to do is get through this courtyard and pass the guards. So I'm going to need you to roll a stealth check. Yes. Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay. Yeah. So you're fine. So as you're walking through, you kind of keep to the shadows. You kind of this is sort of the same time that Gina's story is going on. So it's late evening, getting towards night, so the sun is setting. Um, casting long shadows, which you kind of use to your advantage to kind of creep around. Most of the guards are helots, so they're just kind of walking back and forth on pre-arranged, pre-programmed routes. Uh, one or two are actual organic people, who and they're kind of like the guard captains, so they kind of keep to higher places, so they can kind of observe more of the local area. And the helots are like the ground grunts who are just um, monitoring the, uh, the local areas. Yeah, so you, you're able to creep past all of these guys and you arrive at the, uh, the door. And I would like you now to just do me a sleight of hand check. Uh, that's another 18. Okay, sweet. So the, the door you can see is um, it's a basic simple lock, so you should be able to pick through it easily. Um, how would you like to enter into the building? What do you mean by that question? <laughs> I mean, you, you can pick the lock and go in that way, or do you want to go in through a different way? What kind of lock is it? Is um, it like a typical like thieves tools lock or is it like coded? If you've got like um, a lock pick or something you can just open it that way. I'll do that and like sneak in. Okay, cool. Yeah, door opens. Leave me a slight hand check. 
because I just want to see if the uh, the hinges are squeaky or not, if you're able to. Uh, Not 20, 25. Oh! Okay. Sweet. So yeah, you just go, <laughs> it's, it's like you're barely even there. You are a shadow. You are basically you are a ninja. Non-existent. Yeah. Are you just using regular lockpicks or are you using one of your body mods? Oh, I'm going to use, I'm just going to use a lockpick for now. Okay. okay so um, yeah, you get out your, your lockpicking tools, <laughs> lock opens, door swings open and back. You're basically leaving no trace as you move through. You find yourself in kind of like a normal office, so there's um, desks and chairs all over the place. There's like a, a main office in the corner, which is where the um, the uh, the manager, that's his office. You know, that's the one that you need to get to, so you creep through the office. There's no one here, everyone's gone home already. Mm-hmm. You make your way into the office. What do you want to do? Do I know what it looks like, what I'm looking for? You're, you're looking for the computer, so it's like the, the main terminal of the... Um, Oh, okay. The manager. Is that something I can just see? Yeah, it, it's just like, it's like um, what you'd imagine in like an office building. It's just, it, he's got a desk, there's a computer on it, that's the manager's computer, that's what you've been sent here to um, look at. Okay, uh, I will go over and, is it on? It's not on. I will turn it on. Okay, so the computer comes on, yep. um, <laughs> makes probably some sort of noise, um, not the uh, the windows, bing bong bong bing bong. <laughs> <laughs> bing bing. Okay, so boots up and there it arrives at the place where the manager would put in the password. Two options here. Mm-hmm. One could attempt to speak to it. Mm-hmm. Two could just try and hack past it. Yep. Mm. Sweet fucking cat. <laughs> okay. I speak binary. <laughs> Fair game. Oh. I'm gonna just try and hack past it. Okay. Okay, so yeah, just flight intelligence check with your benefits of your hacking ability. 18. Okay, yeah, you're fine. Because, yeah, the, the password for this, but it's just like a administration office manager. So it's just... A it's just pass- admin one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite that stupid. But yeah, it's not password like... Password exclamation mark. <laughs> well, what I more meant was it's not like something where you have to put in like a thumbprint and an yeah. eye scan and yeah. a password and a breath print or whatever. It's just... <laughs> breath print. <sighs> Thank you, community. Um, <laughs> because it, it's just a password and um, thanks to your hacking ability, you're able to bypass this and you're into the mainframe, so you're now presented with um, all the files in this computer, so you, you basically just got them on a big list in front of you. What specifically am I asked, being asked to like, bring back? So you've been asked to bring back it, all information regarding management of food distribution. Can I try and download the information onto one of my screens? You can, yes. Um, that will be... I think you'll need to do an investigation check first to find all the information. Okay. Dirty 20. Okay, so you very quickly, with your sort of body modded, enhanced brain, you kind of uh, scan through all the files. You fairly, not quickly, but you're able, because you're not, you know, expecting company anytime soon, to be able to methodically go through, find all the right files, and copy paste them into um, your sort of internal flash drive yeah. thing that you've got installed. You're able to put all that in, and that's what you've been sent here for. Do you want to do anything else while you have access to this computer? Is there anything on here that just looks interesting? Should roll me a perception. 14. I mean, there's, there's the sort of stuff that you might expect. So there's stuff about like payroll, work emails. Um, you can have a look at those if you like. Most of them are sort of not that interesting. It's all stuff like this needs to go out today, monitoring levels of what food's going where. Um, one email you find is like an exchange between um, a manager from another site where the latest email basically just says, I don't know. They don't tell me any more than you. So stop asking if you know what's good for you. Oh, okay. Follow up then, is there anything here that looks like it's trying to be like, hidden? There are some files which are like, um, is that where thing where it's, they're not password protected, it's those sort of folders where they are deleted, Ooh. but they are still there, but, but they are locked. So they're like in the recycle bin. Kind of. Okay, I want to see those if I can. I okay. Like just so, in a folder called deleted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are, um, yeah, th- so those are a bit weird. They're password locked, so you're going to need to roll another of your um, intelligence checks for that. Okay, another hack roll. Another hack and roll. Uh, <laughs> I can't do numbers. 16 plus 5 plus 2. Okay, so that's 23. 23. Um, okay, so that's, you're not able to get everything. Um, some of it okay. is like properly locked behind, a, like, as I said before, the computer was relatively easy to get through with just the password, but this stuff you, is that sort of stuff. So you need like clearance levels. Yeah, firewalls I can't get through. Yeah, multiple passwords, firewalls, all that stuff. Um, but you are able to move your maneuver your sort of enhanced brain through enough of it that you're able to get the information regarding how much each district is getting. Ooh, okay. And you're able to figure out enough to realize 
that because um, in, in the city there's kind of a not quite a shortage of food but everyone is basically just scraping by mm -hmm. what these seem to be showing you is there should be enough to go around like plenty so okay. that, that there's basically there should be especially considering the agricultural um, zones coupled with this food that is coming in from you don't know where but from somewhere outside the city there should be more food than there is mm -hmm. so it's being siphoned off is what's it being is a phrase that I'm thinking of, um, like a forced scarcity. Yeah. 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 Okay. I would like to try and clear my tracks. Okay. Judging by what I've rolled so far, I assume it's been like enough mm -hmm. to the point where it's not something that can be traced, but just in case. Yeah. Okay. So for, clear. Yeah. so for clear. So for covering your tracks, I'm pretty sure that would be a stealth check. Okay. So do me, uh, do me one of those. My like best thing. Eighteen. Okay, so yeah, that, that's enough to um, yeah, that, that's enough to kind of erase your presence within the main frame. Yeah. So, um, especially considering this is just a manager, it's not going to be like anyone super high up is going to be like picking through this with a fine tooth tone, uh, fine tooth comb. Um, the next day, manager is going to come come in, sit down at his desk, and he's just going to go through as he always does. If he notices anything's amiss, it's minor enough that he'll just write it off as like, oh, the computer's being a bit weird, and he'll just like shut down and start it up again. <laughs> So yeah, that's basically fine. But on, yes. on your communication uh, device, you get a, a message from your friend, well, your associate, yeah. and your associate Caesar, yeah. um, Caesar. who says, uh, the message basically just reads, Hansel's getting impatient, get back uh, to the club ASAP. Uh, I'm so back a frowny face. <laughs> it's Hansel, he's <laughs> so hot right now. Um, the response uh. just goes, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> No promises. And then I will get out as quickly as possible. <laughs> okay, just do me another strel uh, strelf. Another strelf. stealth check. Do you want strength with that as well? No. Okay. I can't do numbers. 12 okay. plus 7. 19. 19. 19. Okay, yeah, yeah, fine. So much like as you came in, you creep your way back out the uh, the office, back out the courtyard like a shadow. None of the guards even are even aware that you were there at all. Catwoman popcorn. Okay, so you you get you get back to the hole you made in the fence. You slip back out. Um, I presume that you kind of like Cover repair up, the, yeah. the hole that you made. And yeah, so you're you're in the clear. Yeah. As you turn, you see someone kind of on the other side of the street, kind of watching you. Can I try and work out what they look like? Yeah, you can roll a perception. 17 plus, I think it's like two. You can't see that much of them because it is getting quite dark, but you can see enough to see that they're sort of elf heights, but they're keep, they're, they're wearing quite a, a thick coat with a hood to keep their face shadowed. So you can kind of see the bottom half of a face. You can see that it's quite angular, not quite sharp, but um, quite, a, quite a thin face. Oh. Fine. Fine features. Yeah. Fine features. Um, thin Lucky. face, and okay. there's um, you can see like a strand of auburn hair kind of poking out from around the chin. Not familiar to me at all. Not familiar to you at all. Okay. Yeah, you have no idea who, who this person is, okay. but you can kind of see. I immediately try and hide. Just <laughs> instantly. Okay, but I mean, this person kind of clearly went, has been watching. Yeah, yeah has been watching like... you, and when she when they see you, just kind of gives a smile, thumbs up, and then <laughs> you can and then this... just very slowly <laughs> thumbs up in response to a very like quizzical like. Okay. <laughs> and then, what the heck? Then you hear a car backfire. Might shock you enough to kind of just jolt you. Yeah. Second you turn back, they're gone. I'm not going to waste time while thinking, huh, that was weird. I'm just going to run. Head okay. back to base. Okay. So um, you're heading back to Underworld? Yes. So, uh, yeah. So it takes you like 20 minutes, half an hour to get back to Underworld. It's not that far away. Underworld is like a speakeasy type of club. So it's um, positioned behind the back of a library. Amazing. <laughs> As you do. As you do. Love it. Kind of a, an old tiefling guy behind the uh, the library counter. He's got, I like, love him. Silver hair. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> Blue skin, silver hair. He's like leaning on the desk, reading a book. He kind of looks up as uh, you go past. He he knows who you are. He's seen you. Yeah, I'll give him a times. nod. Yeah, not, gives you a nod. He kind of does, reaches under the desk, presses a button and uh, the door behind him opens. <laughs> Revealing on the underworld bar, yeah. and uh, you so can head running. Right I haven't just used to it. He's just used to yeah. me. He's just like yeah, I see this uh, every day. This isn't anything new. Yeah, <laughs> give him a pat on the shoulder as I walk in. Why well, now you go? So you go into underworld. The guy hits the button, and the door closes back up. Mm -hmm. You're now in the underworld bar. It's quite muted. There is music going on, but it's not like loud music. It's just like enough so that there's like mm. some background ambience. 
Um, oh, find tripod season book. Okay. Um, Stop it. <laughs> so Caesar is over in a corner. He's just kind of he's got a drink in his hand. Caesar is uh, is an elf, male elf, blonde hair, hazel eyes, tan skin. He's kind of from the lower end of town, so he's not had a great upbringing. He's, his clothes are kind of shabby, and he's just kind of sitting sitting at this table nursing his nursing a beer. So he sees you approaching, and uh, he says, "Hey, how'd it go? Great." Everything. Obviously, it's easy when you have the implants doing half the work, but. Okay, shut up. Hansel's upstairs, he's waiting for you. Yeah. I'll pat him on the shoulder as well as I walk away. Head up the stairs. Uh, as you reach the top of the stairs, which is um, Hansel's office, the door opens and a dwarf comes out. Clearly, just had a meeting with Hansel. This guy's he, he's clearly a bit of a bruiser. He's got scars on his face. He's kind of got like long red hair, kind of cut down to um, shoulder. He's wearing an eye patch. He's got a couple of knives at his belt as he walks past you kind of just gives you like a, a nod of acknowledgement mm-hmm. and carries on down the stairs and then you hear the dulcet tones of uh, Hansel in the office <laughs> just go Serena that you yes boss right go on in yep uh, yeah I will walk in <laughs> cool so you walk in it, it's a site you're very familiar with um, yeah. the, the office is nicely made up Hansel's clearly doing well for himself he's got nicely polished wood desk shelf of books which are his own private use a little bar in the corner like his own personal supply his two bodyguards uh, Val and Mal the orc twins <laughs> are sort of standing in the corner they're, they're each having enjoying a drink themselves um, give them a two fingered salute Val ignores you completely it's, it's very much like a mockery of just like a bit of a lazy like Hey. Yeah, Val ignores you completely. Mal just gives you a, another nod of acknowledgement. Hansel is he's excited, more excited than normal to uh, to see you, and um, just kind of pokes up. And says, right, how'd it go? Did you get it? Great, I got everything. Fantastic. There was someone outside the plant. Oh. Random person, elf, I guess. I don't know. I didn't see the face. Did they look like law enforcement? Don't think so. Then nothing to do with us. Don't give a crap. The important thing is you got the stuff. Yeah, I got stuff. Marvellous. Is it on your, uh, yeah, 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 I'll thing. send it to. There's uh, a terminal in the corner if you could just uh, yep. upload it in there and then we'll get the rest of your payment. I will send it over and I will also keep a copy of it for myself. Nice. Okay, so you, I guess you plug into the, the terminal and you copy and yeah. paste it. I can, I don't need to plug in, I can just do it from. Okay, so you can just like mentally. Because of the thing I've got. <laughs> You've got inbuilt Wi Fi. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Okay, so you take care of that. While you're in the process of like uploading to the monitor, there's a knock on the door. Hansel says, come in. And um, in walks Thea Valeria who is a elven female, black hair, red eyes. Basically, if you imagine like the stereotypical femme fatale mm-hmm. archetype, this is her. Are you going to do the voice? I'm, I'll, I'll do a voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will look up midway through my thing and... Hey, boss. Hi, kitten. I wasn't expecting to see you here. Yeah, well, yeah. you know how it is. Two she, jobs, all that thing. Yeah, she, she kind of smiles at, at you at hearing this. Turns to Hansel, the smile just kind of goes and it's like a business-like face. Hansel, you need to tell your idiots to stop spending so much time around my club. They're driving away the good business. And it's just like, what they do in their off time is their own business. So I just pay them to do their job. When they're in your neck of the woods, that is none of my business. Yeah, she kind of just <laughs> comes in, leans over the desk. It's like, make it your business or I'll make it my business. Okay. Okay, fine, 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 fine. Serena's just watching her boss's fight. Like, she's doing the, like, lean on the counter thing, just enjoying this conversation. <laughs> Loses grip. <laughs> yeah, because, like, H- Hansel is a, is a male halfling as well. I don't think yeah. I, I mentioned that. So, <laughs> Thea's, got, Thea's got height on Hansel. Thea's got something on him. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, Hansel knows that uh, neither of the Orc twins are going to do anything yeah. about this. Because uh, they know that Thea is the one person they don't mess with. <clears throat> Hansel kind of agrees with that, and he kind of, <laughs> kind of desperately trying to save place, just kind of stands up and scurries over to the monitor to check over the uh, the information that um, you've uploaded, logs through his terminal, and she's like, yep, yeah, cool, that's fine, and then transfers the, the rest of your payment to your account. Right, I should have a job for you um, in a couple of days or so, but in the meantime, your time is your own, so uh, you wait for my contact. Okay. Right, have a good day, and um, just sits back behind his desk and gets back to his business. Um, I'll walk out with Thea, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so Thea's just like, so I haven't seen you in the district much. You, what have you been up to? Oh, uh, you know, running freelance things here and there. you sounding a little bit bored by it all. I wonder why. Just very deadpan. Mm-hmm. She kind of sits but sits at a table, invites you to sit with her, just kind of snaps her fingers at uh, one of the uh, the bartenders, just expecting the, the drink and knowing full well that uh, they're going to bring over what she wants. Now come on, talk to me. What's wrong? It feels like I'm having a firewall, but in real life. Everything's you... repetitive and dull and the same. 
I'm bored. Uh, well, welcome to the city life, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, so what I'm hearing is you could do with a little bit of excitement. Always. What have you got in mind? Well, I may have something planned. It is quite risky, though. Are you sure you are up to it? When have you ever known me to be otherwise? <laughs> That's good to hear. She kind of writes uh, an address on a piece of paper. Do you know the uh, the Inferno Club in the uh, mid- Midtown Acheron? I think so. I don't frequent it, but yeah. There's a chap there by the name of Echo. He's looking to um, put together a crew. He's uh, in the market for some able-bodied individuals. It might involve even going outside the city. There's a moment of just processing what that means, and then she nods. Yeah, I'm in. All right. She kind of tears off and uh, hands you the piece of paper. When you go in, if anyone gives you trouble, just tell them I sent you, and uh, they'll make sure you get to the right people, okay? Will do. Splendid. Okay, well, talk to you later, Kitten. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go over and find Caesar. Okay, so you go over to Caesar. Um, he kind of looks at you and kind of glances between you and Theo and discusses, what was that about? Different kind of job from her than usual. Oh. Yeah, something interesting. <clears throat> I don't know, I'll update it. Uh, I'll update you with it later. Okay. Is later it later. something that you're heading out to now, or...? Yeah, I was going to finish a drink first. Okay. Can you join me? Yeah, absolutely. Nice. So um, you sit with Caesar and um, have a drink. Yeah. And then when you're finished, um, you head out. Yeah, I give him drink. a kiss, head out. Cool. Okay, so uh, you finish your drink with Caesar. You give him a, you give him a, uh, a, a spicy smooch. A, a, good, a goodbye. <laughs> I'll give him a goodbye. A spicy goodbye. Okay, give him a spicy goodbye. And then you head out um, in yeah. the direction of Inferno. <laughs> cool. So... Last but not least, we're now going to head right back over to the very, very other side of the city, over to the back over to the sticks. But here's the thing: it's not just the sticks. We're going into the slums. So this is the sticky sticks. So <laughs> what, the bad sticks. Yeah. So what? What the sticks is to the rest of the city, the slums are to the sticks. This place is rough. Okay, this is where people go when they have literally no alternative. There are people here who are just about scraping by. Um, yeah, so there, there's people kind of milling about in the streets. Um, littering the streets as well are basically what are called in the city the broken. These are helots that aren't, they're not like dead. They are, they're malfunctioning. So something has gone wrong with their wiring. So... Aww. Can I adopt all of them? <laughs> no. Um, I'm just picturing broken rumors. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so... Fully humanoid yeah. robot, uh, automatons. Some I are like... thought was C three PO. Not m- not many miles off. Um, but some... oh, oh no, that's <laughs> worse. Um, yeah, so I mean, imagine C P C three PO, but without a mouth, I guess. Um, so yeah, they're just kind of some of are just like milling around, just kind of walking in circles. Some are just like leaning against the leaning against the wall with their heads just like resting there. Some are just like collapsed in piles. These things are just like malfunctioning in in the brain. And the, the issue is that what happens with the spikes is the bodies are like taken for repurposing their internal CPU. Their brains are recycled into another body, and uh, then they come out the health factory. The problem with these ones is even if they like killed the helots like broke the bodies their brains are the problem and if they those are recycled they're just going to be exactly the same when they come out so there's no point to breaking them really because they're just kind of always going to be like this now going through the uh, the streets of the slums we come upon a small group of clandestine looking figures now these are people who not necessarily native to the slums but they know that this is the best place for keeping out of sight and uh, there's like a group of five of them one of them just kind of like checks around to make sure the area is clear and then on the sort of signal that it's all clear what another of them lifts up a manhole cover and they descend down into the sewers and the manhole goes down we follow this group as they make their way through they we enter into a large like cavern-esque sort of room like this, ah, this dungeon <laughs> <laughs> so there's a huge room underground and this is the church of the deeper so this is a underground religion that is in no way approved by the city. <laughs> I'm being stared down. <laughs> Good. Don't worry, light will find you. So they, so the, these five arrive in a large open chamber illuminated by soft blue light, and then these guys take off their cloaks, take off their hoods, uh, revealing who they are. And there's like a, a collection of all the, the different sorts of uh, peoples who 
populate the city. So it's not just elves, it's not just tieflings, there's all sorts here. But one of these people is Briley Essie. So also known as Law. Also known as Law. Quinn, could you please describe Briley? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. She stands at around six foot two. She is a pink tiefling with grey eyes. She's got long black hair that's been tangled up in her horns. She's got almost bat-like wings. She's dressed in a lot of like greens and blues and browns to kind of keep herself mixed in. And she also has a little mini bat. On her shoulder, it's a little purple bat and it's covered in like swirly smoke marks. <gasps> oh, that's cute. <laughs> okay, so you kind of gather in this sort of clump in this uh, in this cavern. It's not like a, a formal church. There's no like pews or anything. There's nowhere really to sit. It's basically just a big room where the Church of the Deep gather. You kind of arrive just like halfway through the um, the address that the church leader Miel Nokani, um, another elf, uh, tall, platinum blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, leader of the church. Miel is addressing the crowd. He's saying that the time has finally come. It is upon us. We have waited. We have prayed for this day. The deeper one has promised us salvation from the people above, the fools who still follow the will of Guyanis. It is known that it was the world breakers who destroyed the world, who reduced it to a waste. But Guyanis was the one who brought the survivors into this city so that he could control them to keep them from the world that is our birthright. But the Deeper One has promised us that the time is now for us to emerge from this prison, to reclaim the world, and one of you will do this. It will fall to one of you to move out of the city, out of this prison, and reclaim the world, to take the world from the false gods who control this planet of ours and bring it back to us. The story of the World Breakers, sure, the World Breakers were probably a thing at one point, but they are long gone. And we are kept in this city now because we are told to fear the World Breakers and the world outside. They're, they're gone. The time has come for us to go, to leave this place and get back to life. And the church is kind of like muttering and nodding in agreement, mm. saying, yes, yeah, the time yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get to it. <laughs> Soon, the deeper one will speak and he will choose one of us to venture out and find the temple of the arch false god of Lurden, the one who stole the world from us in the wake of the world breakers. While this guy's talking, there's um, someone off to like the to his side, kind of facing the crowd instead of like facing Miel. Um, this guy is uh, Alan Jerica. He's uh, another tiefling. Um, he's kind of smirking confidently because th- this guy's like the favourite of the church. This is the guy that everyone kind of assumes is going to be the one who's chosen to take up this task and he's kind of been training Smug his whole Mug bastard. Yeah. Smug little... Yeah, because th- yeah. this guy is like, he's, bit, he's, he's tall, he's strong, he's fast, he's good with a weapon. Like, this, this guy has been like training for this for a long time because he's like so, so sure that it's going to be him. Body mods. <laughs> <laughs> Mial ends his address and he just says, now, let us pray and wait for the deeper one to speak. And everyone kind of bows their head and there's kind of like a, a silence so like, tense settles over the crowd that you could like break it you know that kind of silence it's just like oh we're waiting it's gonna happen it's, it's gonna, gonna happen, happen. It's, it's gonna, gonna happen, happen at some point oh come on come on and then after a while you don't know how long because there's no like clock in here it feels like ages but it might have been like a minute but while you wait you hear kind of like this hissing sound not like a not like a snake's hiss more just like the sound of small beads running over each other you know that sort of sound just like a very very soft rattling oh like the rain stick yeah like like a rain stick sort of thing so it's just like a tss, tss, yeah. and you or anyone in the crowd who opens your eyes and like looks at the source of the uh, the noise you kind of see that sort of thing happening there's a bunch of it's kind of like a, a pit at the back of the church like a very small hole and out of this there's kind of like a bunch of small beads just kind of climbing each other forming this sort of tendril after a while it solidifies into something that's not quite a hand, not quite a tentacle, it's just sort of like that sort of thing. And at the tip of each, for want of a better word, fingertip, there's just like a soft glinting of blue light. And (laughs) and Meow sees this and he kind of like spreads his hand in that sort of stereotypical cult pose. (laughs) The time has come, my children. The deeper one shall now speak and choose. We have waited so long. And now, the one who will venture out will be revealed to us. So th- this kind of tendril hand thing made of uh, multiple beads, it has been kind of like 
stationary while Mel's been speaking, but as he kind of finishes this address, it starts like extending and moving yeah. and kind of moving in towards the crowd. Yeah. Now your your good friend, A and your, your the, the smug friend <laughs> from uh, who was like smiling earlier, yeah. kind of like turns expectantly as the sort of tendril thing approaches him. Yeah, my eyes are on him, kind of watching. Yeah, like ev- everyone's is like everyone is expecting A and to be the one chosen, and everyone's just kind of like watching with like wide eyes, mm-hmm. waiting for like the mm-hmm. moment of connection. Mm-hmm. But, to the surprise of literally everyone in the room, it moves past. Oh! oh. oh. A I assume whispers and... <laughs> and so the, the finger things at the end of the tendrils just kind of like move around, all of them in different directions, which if you're like imagining as a hand is very upsetting. <laughs> oh no! It's like, basically imagine fingers with no bones in it. So oh, no! Like... <laughs> Oh, it's so much worse now. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm having a great time. <laughs> and then, in like a, a second, which kind of cuts the tension like a knife, all of the little tendrils at the end of this one long tendril freeze and all move in the direction. Of... Ah! <laughs> I wonder who it could be. <laughs> all turn in the direction of Briley. And then, not quite fast enough for it to be terrifying, but quite fast oh, sugar. it kind of moves through the air how do you want to react to this <laughs> she is just oh no she's going to get her wings out ready to go okay <laughs> so are you going to try and avoid the, the thing she she kind of takes a second and then slowly closes her wings back in okay just kind of watching what's going to happen okay what you might not have noticed because like through the fog of uh, like Panic. Panic is that when your wings spread, the tendril kind of slowed a bit and just kind of drew back a bit. But as your wings like fold back in, it then go- just goes, okay, cool. And then oh. moves towards you and then like hovers in front of your face, like no more than like a foot away. So it's like uh. right there. And, <laughs> and your, your vision is just full of these like little black beaded things with blue lights at the end of it. And then it just goes, oh, no. And fixes itself to your face. Okay. <laughs> Ew. Oh no. But then all you can see and hear are these like black beads just running all over your face like water. <laughs> Imagine um, a rain stick, but like magnified in your head, ah. and that's all you can hear. Yeah. And then suddenly, like in a second, that stops, and there's like a second of quiet, and then you just hear foresight online. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I know that name. I know that name. You do know that. I know that name. Right. Oh. Okay. So now you can write in your character sheet your patron as a warlock is, is Foresight. Foresight. Oh boy. So Foresight, aka the deeper one, is now your patron. So the, the whole church is kind of like turned to. <laughs> you can do a perception check if you like, but like I, it, it's obvious. Yeah, it's it's pretty obvious that everyone in the church, like your vision is no longer obscured. Okay. The tendril is now gone. Mm-hmm. It's like the the beads that made up the tendril basically just like. Not quite disintegrated, but it all just fell apart, just like in a shower on the floor, and that's now just all on the floor. Basically, the thing that it was carrying is now in you. The little black beads have served their purpose and function. Cool. And now the church, like everyone in the church has kind of turned to you. Some of them are looking shocked. Some of them just surprised. Aya in his looking robbed <laughs> <laughs> but Miel is like his expression is completely neutral he just walks over to you and like takes you by the shoulders and, and just like the deeper one has chosen you it is your job and your duty to carry us into the next age he kind of turns and like one hand still on your shoulder the one hand like gesturing towards like a, a back room just says please follow me and I will explain things further that would uh, help so you kind of move your way through through the crowd. A, cu- a couple of them just kind of like half heartedly kind of smile and just go, congratulations. <laughs> Does Ian say anything? Uh, Ian is fuming, so he's just like not saying a word. That's fair. <laughs> okay, so you go into the back room. It is now just you and Miel. And he says, so I can understand if uh, this is not what you were expecting. Y- yeah, just, 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 just love it. But... The Deeper One is an ancient being. He would not have chosen you if not for a reason. It must have seen something in you or something about you that made it sure that you were the one to carry out this task. Have have you heard his voice at all? I heard maybe one thing. All I heard was him say Foresight Online. 
the writings say that that is that will be the first words he he speaks to the chosen one. Allegedly, according to the writings, he will begin speaking in your mind more as your connection with him gets stronger. He is supposed to offer guidance. You won't be alone in this. Is Sorry, I'm a little flustered. This is not what I was expecting. I, no offence. No one was I was expecting, expecting this, this to go a, a whole other way. But yeah, so you, the important thing I want to convey here is you will not be alone in this. The deeper one will speak to you and offer guidance. You won't be expected to shoulder this all by yourself. Right. But as I said earlier, your task will, in, will require you to leave the city. You will need to travel a long way. I don't know how long it's, how long, how far it will be because I've never left the city myself, so I don't know how far away the Temple of Avlurdan is, but the writings say that you will need to travel there, and when you uh, when you reach there, as the Chosen of the Deeper One, you will then be given the information to undo the wrong that has been done to this world. I don't know if you'll have to fight Avlurdan, or what if there'll be like a, a champion, or like a, a trial thing to go through. It is not clear what the Chosen One will have to do, but all that, all that is written is the Deeper One will guide you on your path. Huh. You will need to leave the city, so I suggest you make arrangements as soon as possible. Say any goodbyes you need to make, because the world is broken. And if the Deeper One's task is to have any chance of success, sooner is better than later. Yeah. So the sooner you leave, the better our prospects are. So there is someone I know someone who has made their intention clear to offer assistance to our cause. Uh, his name is Echo, and he is... <laughs> he's located in a club called Inferno in uh, Midtown Akron. Do you, do you know it? Roughly? I haven't really been out of many places around here. I'm sure I can find it. Okay. Well, it, it's fairly easy to get to. You, you just take the subway and uh, take it to the central station. And there's a, there's a station right next to Inferno, so you can just get off there and you'll be able to make your way there fairly easily. But um, yeah, so I'd say make, make any goodbyes you need to make and uh, head off there as soon as possible. Yeah. So what do you want to do? She's going to go see Ian. <laughs> <laughs> hey, buddy. Just going to rub his yes. nose in it, find that wound, get that salt. <laughs> No, she's generally going out over there out of good intentions. Okay. She's okay. not okay. going to have salt in the wound. She's going out there with good intentions. Okay, so um, you move out into um, into the, the cavern. Ayn is there, and he's keeping himself to himself. He's not engaging with anyone, uh, and everyone around him is just kind of seeing the expression on his face and just like, I'm just going to leave that. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that alone. But, yeah, she will walk over Ayn. He just kind of looks at you. <laughs> just kind of just like that sort of breath was like oh god I'm so angry but I can't and he's just kind of force like forcing himself to bow down and <gasps> no, 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 yes no, no, no. chosen how can I assist you don't start with all that you are the chosen you I need to don't give to I, I really want to because if this chance has been taken by you I want to observe the proper form of this go for it I, I know sure. you think I know you're th you think you might be like doing this nicely, but this is like making me more angry. Okay, go for it, go for it. What, how, how can I assist you? I just wanted to check in on you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh. I'm just watching Cassie's <laughs> Cassie. Oh. I know we're all in a bit of shock, and um, I'm not entirely sure why it was me. The deeper one will have made his decision for a reason. So, I'll be honest, I don't understand the choice. Neither do I. <laughs> but there will be a reason. Everything the Deeper One does is for a reason, and it is for the redemption of the world. So if you are truly his choice, then you are, by definition, the best choice for this role. So if this is truly your burden to bear, then I wish you well. There is no ill will or blood between us, because it is the will of the Deeper One. So all power to you. <sighs> Sorry, I'm really trying to... Just a whole lot of disappointment I'll today. I'll give you some space, and she'll okay. head off. Okay. Is she being swarmed, or is she good? Not swarms, just kind of... Um, everyone's kind of, like, treating you with, like, a respectful cool. distance. So it's, it, when you pass people, it was just kind of, like, bowing their heads and, like, giving you giving you a lot of respect. She'll head to get her stuff, and um, she will make her way up. Okay. As you kind of approach your stuff, you start hearing whisperings in your head. Okay. The time is now. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well you don't have to yell. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I just, it's its a lot to take on right now. Yeah, there's no response to that. God damn it! <laughs> okay, so uh, you get your stuff, and uh, are you going to head right out to Inferno? Yes. Cool. And on that note, we will end it there. <laughs> now, <laughs> thank you for in- sitting with us through episode one of Escape from the Walled City. Join us next time for episode two, where our party will gather and begin the quest. Ooh. <laughs>